Dedication of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Dedication. Dear boys and girls, I have often wondered about the strat, have not you? Better bushel of peanuts you have. Well, while we've been wondering, the Wizard of Oz has been inventing an ozoplane to go stratospheering. Oh, there's some pretty high sky riding in this adventure, I can tell you. And with Dot, Jellia Jam, the Scarecrow, Cowardly Lion and Tin Woodman along, you can imagine the thrills and excitement. And the soldier with the green whiskers hopes you'll give him credit for the part he played in the affair. You know, it's grand to get together over a book once a year and have a good laugh, isn't it? I'd like to know what makes you laugh loudest and longest. I think I laughed most at the Cowardly Lion. Yours for fun, now and Oz always. Ruth Plumley Thompson This book is dedicated to John R. Neal, whose drawings have added much to the merriment and gaiety of all my imaginations. So, from the Royal Historian of Oz, to its Imperial Illustrator, bows, cheers, and heartfelt appreciation. Ruth Plumley Thompson End of Dedication Chapter 1 of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 1. At Home with the Wizard of Oz. In his big, brightly lighted laboratory back of the throne room, the Wizard of Oz paced impatiently forth and back, his hands clasped tightly behind him. Every minute or two he would glance at the clock or dart over to peer out to the already darkening garden. Are you sure you told them all, Jellia? Are you sure you told them tonight? he asked, turning to the pretty little serving maid who was setting a table near the fire, for the fall evening was quite cool and frosty. Four, five, six, seven. Jellia, counting places, nodded her head firmly to answer the wizard's question, then stepped back to regard her handiwork with complete satisfaction. Oh, doesn't that tiny house in the centre look too cute and cunningish? Real smoke coming out of the chimney, too. However did you manage it, Wiz? And having those silver slippers at each place for nuts and candies is just plain beautiful. Do you really think so? The little wizard positively blushed with pleasure. Well, you see, Jellia, this party is to celebrate Dorothy's first trip to the Emerald City. That is an exact model of the house in which she blew from Kansas to Oz in a cyclone. The house that fell on the Wicked Witch of the West and destroyed her, all but her silver slippers. Remember? Oh, everybody remembers that, said Jellia with a toss of her head that set all her green cap ribbons fluttering. If I live to be a million, I'll never forget the day she came to this castle with the cowardly lion, the scarecrow, and the tin woodman. Not if I live to be a million. Will I light the candles now, Wiz, dear, or wait until they arrive? Oh, wait until they arrive, by all means. But see here. The wizard, taking a last look at the party table, was plainly distressed. You've only set seven places, Jellia, and there are eight of us. My idea was to have everyone immediately associated with Dorothy's first visit, and that would be one, Dorothy herself, two, myself, three, yourself, four, the cowardly lion, five, the scarecrow, six, the tin woodman, seven, the soldier with the green whiskers, and eight, the guardian of the gate. Quick, my dear, another plate for the guardian of the gate. He's not coming, announced Jellia primly. He says he has not deserted his post for forty years and does not intend to desert it now. But if you'll send his refreshments to the guardhouse, he'll take it very kindly. I've already fixed him a basket, said Jellia, smoothing her apron. Good old guardy. The wizard absently brushed back the hair he no longer had. Then, hearing voices and steps in the corridor, bounced over to open the door, while Jellia tripped joyously about, lighting the candles set everywhere in the big workshop. Candle and firelight are much cosier for parties, and it all looked so cheery and gay that Dorothy, who was first, stopped short in the doorway with an exclamation of delight. "'Oh, wizard, how beautiful! Oh, I do wish Ozma could see it all!' "'Tut, tut!' 
chuckled the wizard, leading her into the room. Ozma is having a fine time in Glinda's palace by now. To tell the truth, Dorothy, this party is just for you, and to remind us all of the old Oz days when you were nothing but a humbug, snorted the scarecrow, laughing so hard he had to lean against the door jamb. Don't forget he gave you your famous brains, friend. The tin woodman spoke reprovingly, for Nick Chopper did not like anyone's feelings to be hurt, even in fun. And don't forget he gave me my splendid heart. And me my grade A double distilled instant acting courage, purred the cowardly lion. Moving over to the fire, the big beast stretched himself luxuriously on the hearth rug. And don't forget our little Wiz was once supreme ruler of Oz boomed the soldier with the green whiskers, marching three times round the party table, the thin, immensely tall soldier brought up with a smart salute before their embarrassed little host. Three cheers for the Wizard of Oz, cried Jellia Jam. Seizing a silver bell with an emerald clapper, she rang it so hard the cowardly lion's mane drew straight back, and even the candles flickered. Thank you, thank you very much. The wizard bowed and rubbed his ear, which still tingled from the cheers and the bell ringing. But where is Toto, Dorothy? I thought, of course, you'd bring your little dog. Oh, Toto's with Ozma, explained Dorothy, drawn in spite of herself to the brightly decorated party table. You know how he dotes on travelling, so Ozma took him along for company. Then, of course, he cannot be here, sighed the whiz regretfully. Now, Jellia, off with that cap and apron. Tonight you are my guest, and not a maid in waiting to Ozma or anyone else. Besides, I've asked Fred John to serve the supper. Dorothy, suppose you sit at the head. I'll sit at the foot, and the others may find their own places. My place will always be next to little Dorothy, rumbled the cowardly lion, hoisting himself sleepily to the chair beside the little girl. Mine will be next to the pickles. Mmm, I love pickles, said the soldier, slipping into the seat next to the lion, while Jellia, with a purposeful bounce, settled near a plate of green cookies. There was no doubt where the tin woodman and scarecrow would sit, for at one plate the wizard had put a silver box of metal polish and an emerald bottle containing purest oil. Then, instead of a chair, he had provided a bale of freshly packed straw for the scarecrow. Well, well, here we all are. Rubbing his hands briskly, the wizard beamed on his guests, as Fred John, wearing his best suit of green and silver, bustled in with the first course. And isn't it fun to be here? Dorothy took a long, satisfying sip of her Oz aid. I'm awfully glad I came back to live in the land of Oz, aren't you, wizard? A country where a body grows no older, where animals talk as easily as men, and where the practice of magic is not only possible but practical, a country like that has many advantages, admitted the wizard, winking at the cowardly lion who was drinking his fruit juice in a refined way from a huge green aquarium. I myself have never regretted the years spent in this marvellous fairyland. Sometimes I can hardly believe I ever did live in Omaha, or travel through the West with a circus. I know, agreed Dorothy, nodding her head slowly. Kansas, when I think of it, seems very far away, as much like a dream, I suppose, as Oz seems like a dream to boys and girls in Kansas who read Oz history. Oh, why think of Kansas? Jellia spoke scornfully. In Kansas you are only an ordinary little girl, while here you are a princess, and second in importance to our ruler, Ozma herself. And in Kansas, observed the Scarecrow, as Dorothy rather self-consciously straightened her crown, I'll bet you never had as much fun, nor as many adventures as we have here. The Scarecrow, being well stuffed with straw, never indulged in any refreshments. In fact, he just came to parties for the conversation, and to be sure of a good time, he tried to do all the talking himself. That's right, said Dorothy thoughtfully. That cyclone was about the only thing that ever happened in Kansas. A great blow to you, my dear, but a fortunate thing for Nick and me. The scarecrow patted the tin woodman affectionately on the funnel he wore for a hat. If you had not blown to Oz, I'd probably still be hanging on a pole in that cornfield, and Nick would be rusting away his life in the greenwood. And in some ways, mused Dorothy, looking dreamily at the model of her small Kansas house, in some ways that first adventure always will seem best. Just imagine how surprised I was to blow all those miles and find myself in a strange, wonderful country like Oz. The Munchkins thought I was a sorceress, because my house had killed the Wicked Witch of the East. Then the Good Witch of the North told me to put on her silver shoes and go to the Emerald City to ask the Great Oz to send me home. 
and on the way I discovered you, and do you remember how astonished I was when I lifted you down from your pole and found you really were alive and could talk? The Scarecrow nodded cheerfully. And remember how we travelled on together till we found the Tin Woodman, went on Dorothy. And Nick told us about the witch who had enchanted his axe so that it chopped off a leg here and an arm there, and finally his head and body too. And after each accident, he'd go to a tinsmith who made him new tin arms and legs, and finally even a body and a head. You didn't mind being tin at all, did you, Nick? Except that day you went out to chop and left your oil can at home. Then that storm came up, your joints rusted, and you couldn't move, and there you had been, rusting and helpless for months. But we hustled back to your hut, fetched the oil can, and fixed you up in fine shape, didn't we, old fellow? The scarecrow flung his flimsy arm around Nick Chopper's shoulder, and the tin woodman, at the mere mention of rust, uncorked the emerald bottle and let three drops of oil slide down his neck. I shall never forget your kindness, he told them earnestly, turning his head first to look at Dorothy, and then at the scarecrow. And after that, you came along so the wizard could give you a new heart. Dorothy reminded him gaily, and right afterwards we met the cowardly lion. And he was more afraid of us than we were of him, teased the scarecrow, leaning across the table to give the lion a poke. Yes, I was just a big coward in those days, admitted the lion, blinking approvingly at the rare roast Fred John had brought him instead of the chicken he was serving the others. Just a great big coward, ho hum. But not too cowardly to fight for us said Dorothy, taking quick little bites of her biscuit, and to come with us to the Emerald City. Oh, that was because I wanted the wizard to give me some courage, roared the lion, and weren't we surprised when we did reach the Emerald City to find it all built of green marble and studded with real emeralds, and remember how the guardian of the gate gave us all green specks, even me, and then led us up to the palace. You looked awfully funny in those specks laughed dorothy i'll never forget how funny but remember it was i who carried your messages to oz put in the soldier with the green whiskers of course it was said dorothy nodding her head quickly you gave us some splendid advice soldier and jellia showed us to the grandest rooms in the castle and loaned me the loveliest dresses to wear i liked you from the very first declared jellia choking a bit on her seventh cookie but old man Wizzy wouldn't give us a thing, said the Scarecrow, waving his napkin towards the head of the table. He told us we'd have to kill the Witch of the West before he'd send Dorothy home or grant any of our requests. But you see, I didn't know any real magic then. The wizard looked quite unhappy, for he did not like to remember the time before he was a real wizard. And besides, I needed more time. Ho, ho, you were doing very well for yourself, chuckled the Scarecrow living in a splendid castle and having the whole country eating out of your hand as it happened we did kill the witch of the west or at least dorothy melted her with a bucket of water and the winkies were so tickled they gave us all presents and made nick their emperor so when we got back at last you did give me some brand new brains and nick a red plush heart and me some real red true blue courage grinned the cowardly lion wiping his mouth delicately with the tip of his tail and you made me ruler of Oz. Ah, my majesty, the scarecrow. Ah, those were the days. The scarecrow thumped his pudgy chest and fairly glowed at the memory. You would have taken me back to Kansas too, only your balloon flew away too fast, didn't it? Dorothy leaned all the way across the table to pat the wizard's arm. But don't forget it was I who told you to go to the palace of Glinda, the good sorceress of the south, interrupted the soldier with the green whiskers. So we all went to Glinda's, rumbled the cowardly lion, half closing his eyes. And Glinda told Dorothy the witch's silver shoes would carry her home. And they did. There was a little silence following the lion's last sentence, as if all of Dorothy's friends were recalling their sorrow at that first parting from their cheerful little comrade. But you soon came back, declared the scarecrow, balancing a fork on the edge of his tumbler. And so did our little wizard. Well, to tell the truth, Omaha seemed rather dull after the Emerald City, admitted the wizard, motioning for Fred John to bring on the dessert. This caused many admiring oohs and ahs when it arrived, for it was ice cream, moulded into small tin woodmen, scarecrows, lions, and all the other guests. Then, out of a huge frosted cake the footman set down before Dorothy, flew four little witches riding green broomsticks straight into the fire. 
I tell you, it takes a real wizard to perform a trick like that. Nick Chopper wagged his head solemnly. You certainly have made progress, since Ozma made you chief magician of the realm. Well, drawled the wizard, pushing the pickle dish away from the soldier with the green whiskers, who had already eaten twenty-seven, and was looking rather dill. Magic is just like any other science. It takes practice. Of course, if you are a born fairy like Ozma and the former rulers of Oz, working spells and charms just comes natural, like playing the piano by ear. But if you are not a fairy, you must study witchcraft and sorcery, as I have done with Glinda the Good. It has only been by continuous study and research that I have managed to perfect myself in the arts of wizardry. Well, how is wizness lately? inquired the scarecrow, wrinkling his cotton forehead at all the big words. Fine, just fine, the wizard assured him brightly. Marching over to his desk, he returned with a long, tube-like object, resembling a seaman's spyglass. This is one of my latest inventions, he confessed modestly. Here, take a look. Beaming with anticipation, he pressed the spyglass into Dorothy's hands. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Schragen. Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 2 The Wizard's Spyglass. With the wizard's latest invention clapped to one eye and pointed straight at the wizard himself, Dorothy peered through the green glass, hardly knowing what to expect. Certainly not what happened, for, from the other end of the instrument, a composed voice began making announcements proudly and impressively as a radio speaker. You are now looking at Oscar, Zoroaster, Phaedric, Isaac, Norman, Henkel, Emmanuel, Ambrose, Dix. It informed them crisply calls himself oz after the first letters of his first two names as his other initials spell pinhead born in omaha diggs ran away as a young man to join the circus where he made balloon ascensions to amuse the crowds his balloon bearing his initials o z one day in a storm oscar's balloon was carried to our wonderful land of oz at that time, the rightful king of the country and his son had been destroyed by Mombi the witch, who had also enchanted and hidden away Ozma, the little granddaughter of this unfortunate monarch, and four witches had divided the country between them. When the balloon bearing the name Oz on its side sailed out of the clouds, the inhabitants instantly hailed the traveler from America as their ruler, supposing him to be another member of the famous fairy family of Oz unable to return to america oz accepted the people's decision with good grace and ruled the realm for many years under his wise direction the people built this castle and the famous city of emeralds and the four witches thinking oz more powerful than they did not question his rule or authority later when little dorothy from kansas arrived in oz the wizard decided to return with her to the united states leaving the Scarecrow to rule in his place. The Scarecrow was deposed by Ginger and her army of girls. Ginger, in turn, was conquered by Glinda, the Good Witch of the South, who also forced Mombi to disenchant Ozma, the young and rightful girl ruler of the realm. Ozma has ruled over Oz ever since. Not long after Ozma was restored to her throne, the wizard returned to Oz, and our clever girl ruler, made him chief magician of the realm in this ancient and honorable capacity he has served ever since period stop drop or point elsewhere these last words were uttered so rudely dorothy almost did drop the spyglass my my goodness guessed the little girl it always says that when it has told all it knows you see it is a telescope explained the wizard reaching out for his spyglass with an embarrassed cough. "'And it certainly tells all, all right,' roared the Scarecrow, pushing back his chair. "'Congratulations, my dear Mr. Diggs!' "'Look 
out. Be careful. Don't you point that thing at me. Please don't. The big lion simply cowered in his chair, and no wonder he felt nervous. There had been some pretty savage incidents in that old lion's life before he met Dorothy and came to live in the Emerald City as a civilized citizen of Oz. And the thought of the tell telling all it knew about him made the cowardly lion positively shudder. But the others were so busy examining the wizard's spyglass, they did not even notice the lion's terrific agitation. You know, a thing like that would be of great value to a traveler, remarked Nick Chopper, tapping the telescope thoughtfully with his tin fingers. That's just what I figured, grinned the wizard, thrusting the instrument into his pocket. And speaking of traveling, I have something else to show you. Clapping on his hi-hat, Ozma's chief magician hastened over to the door that opened on the garden, signaling for the others to come along. Having had experience with inventors before, Dorothy and Jellia snatched up coats, Dorothy her own, and Jellia one of the wizards. Then, followed by the rest of the party, they stepped out into the sparkling starlit evening. The soldier with green whiskers, who had stopped to eat the last pickle in the dish and stuff an extra piece of cake in his pocket, came last of all. At each step he gave a little groan. For, all by himself, the soldier had eaten enough for a whole army. But then, he was a whole army. He was every single man, private, corporal, captain, major, colonel, and general in the entire fighting force of Oz. Anxious to exhibit his latest treasure, the wizard walked rapidly along, leading the little party across the park, through the Emerald City, out of the gates, and into the woodland beyond. Where do you suppose he's taking us? shivered Jellia, thinking longingly of the cozy fire back in the laboratory. No knowing, giggled the scarecrow, but a hunting we shall go, a hunting we shall go. Ta 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 ta! Blowing an imaginary horn, the scarecrow pretended to gallop and fell flat on his face, his legs never being what you could really call reliable. Shh! whispered the wizard, looking back warningly as the tin woodman jerked the straw man to his feet. What I am about to show you has been seen by no one in Oz except my faithful assistants, so please be more quiet. You mean it's a secret, whispered Dorothy, skipping forward to catch up with the wizard and linking her arm through his. Two secrets, confided Ozma's chief magician mysteriously. Pushing impatiently through the last fringe of trees, the group stepped into a moonlit clearing. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of Ozo Planning with the Wizard of Oz。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Schragen. Ozo Planning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 3. Latest Invention of the Wizard of Oz Ooh, a conservatory, murmured Jellia, blinking at the shining glass structure that occupied the entire treeless space. A barn, if you ask me, guessed the scarecrow. But why build it of glass, Mr. Wiz? Because glass is the latest and lightest building material known. But this is no barn, as you'll soon discover. Handing his flashlight to Dorothy, the wizard slid back the vast doors, switching on the lights, and stood back, his hands in his pockets as the little group in silence and astonishment viewed two shining planes housed as snugly as giant butterflies in a glass cocoon. Airplanes, exclaimed Dorothy, when she found her voice at last. No, ozoplanes, corrected the wizard, trying to keep the excitement out of his voice. Somewhat like the planes in America but more powerful, for remember, my dear, I had not only the scientific knowledge of aeronautics available to mortals, but the scientific knowledge of magic to help me as well. Well, echoed the tin woodsman, gazing approvingly at the wizard's plane, which except for their silver wings might have been huge silver and glass torpedoes. Not for the army, I hope, exclaimed the soldier, clutching his whiskers nervously. 
being the entire army himself and quite old-fashioned and set in his ways, the soldier felt sure he could not pilot these gleaming airplanes. Oh, no, no, no! The wizard frowned at the mere thought of war. These are pleasure planes for traveling and exploring the unknown regions of the upper air. As soon as Ozma returns from the south, I plan to present them both to our illustrious young ruler and arrange for her to make the first triumphant flight. But there are two, said Dorothy a little wistfully. She had hoped to make the first flight with the wizard herself. Of course, of course, he answered in a matter-of-fact way. Most experimental flights fail because they depend on one ship. We shall have two! We? Dorothy brightened up considerably at the wizard's plural. Yes, we, repeated the wizard, turning round to smile at the little girl. Counting Ozma and those of us here, there will be eight passengers, four for each plane. Now, now, please don't bother about me, begged the cowardly lion, his tail dragging on the ground at the very thought of flying. I'd not think of troubling you. Besides, I'm much too heavy for flying. Not at all, not at all, the wizard reassured him with a wink. I have made exact calculations about weight, old fellow, and you and the scarecrow balance each other out nicely, so don't worry about that. Oh, I'm not worrying about that, rumbled the lion, rearing up on his hind legs to read the names outlined in emeralds on the luminous sides of the wizard's ships. Ozpril and Oztober, the lion spoke in a slightly trembling roar. Hmm, hmm, crumph. Why, those are beautiful names, exclaimed Dorothy, tilting back her head to spell them out for herself. I thought they were rather neat, said the wizard, complacently. Suitable, too, one to rise and one to fall. Expressively, he lifted an arm and let it fall limply to his side. To, to fall, quavered the lion, dropping to all fours. Oh, just in a figurative way, of course, the wizard shrugged his shoulders. You will observe, he went on enthusiastically, that these planes need no runway or special track to take off. They are really balloon planes. Note these round pockets on top of the fuselage. The lion blinked rapidly, for he had no idea that the fuselage meant the body of the plane. But the others nodded quite knowingly. Well, those, declared the inventor proudly, are my own patented balloon attachments. At the touch of a button... The wings are depressed and the balloon inflated with a magic gas, lighter than helium, that carries the ship as high and as far as desired. Then the balloon can be deflated and the ozoplane can continue under its own power. But you'll readily see how my ship, with its balloon attachment, has twice the altitude possibilities of an ordinary airplane. Ha! We shall fly higher than higher! boasted the little wizard happily. Oh, quite, agreed the tin woodsman, mounting the ladder of the Oztober, the soldier with the green whiskers pressing nervously at his heels. But how will you move them out of here? inquired the scarecrow, taking off his hat and scratching his cotton head. Oh, as to that, the wizard pulled a switch just behind him, where the top of the glass airdrome lifted like the lid of an enormous jewel box. Hmm, I see. The scarecrow slapped his knee and grinned with appreciation. Off with the roof! Up with the planes! Exactly! Seizing the straw man's arm, the wizard urged him toward the ladder of the Ozpril, Dorothy skipping cheerfully behind them. After Dorothy plodded the cowardly lion, talking to himself in anxious whispers and growls. Be sure not to touch anything over there, called the wizard, as Nick and the soldier with green whiskers disappeared into the cabin of the other plane. I'll keep an eye on them, promised Jellia, tripping up the ladder as lightly as a feather. Don't give us a thought, Wiz, dear. Jellia's so funny, laughed Dorothy. Sensible, too, added the wizard, helping the little girl over the high door sill into the plane. While he and the scarecrow went forward to examine the steering gear, Dorothy looked delightedly around the snug little cabin. There were four seats upholstered in pale green leather along one side. The whole top was of thick glass, through which she could distinctly see the moon and stars winking down at her. The side walls of the Ospril were of a silvery gray, with all the trimmings in green. At the back was a small dinette, with chairs and table locked to the floors, as they are on sea-going vessels. A cabinet full of china, a wall full of charts, a bookcase full of books, and a tiny kitchen and dressing room completed the equipment. 
It's just as cozy as the little house, sighed Dorothy contentedly, as the cowardly lion, having glanced round in a discouraged way, seated himself in one of the green chairs and pressed his nose against the round window pane. Won't we have fun, Lion A, when we really get off? Getting off will be the best fun of all, sniffed the lion, glancing briefly at the door. The lion, as you probably have guessed, felt no enthusiasm for the trip. Once, much against his will, he had been carried to an island in the sky, and that experience had been more than enough. In his own mind, he already had decided not to accompany the wizard on his proposed flight. Yes, sir, when the party assembled for the trip, he would just turn up missing and manage to stay behind. Immensely relieved by the secret decision, he ambled forward. You will notice, the wizard was pointing out briskly, that I have done away with all controls and levers. On this board are all the buttons necessary to operate the ship. It looks like an organ, observed Dorothy, squinting at the bright array of buttons set in the top of the table within easy reach of the first seat. Must you play all those stops and starters to guide the plane? Not quite all, smiled the wizard. But if we wish to start, I'd first press this green button to depress the wings and inflate our balloon. Next, I'd push the button marked up, and if I decided to go north, this north button as well. Then I'd use the wheel to hold her steady, and if I preferred to go up in a gradual way, I'd push this button marked zig. And I suppose if you saw something interesting or wished to dodge a mountain, you'd zag, suggested the scarecrow, indicating the zag button with his pudgy finger. Or you could spin, spiral, or level off. Stop! Stop! panted the cowardly lion, clapping his paw to one eye. All this up, zig, down, zig makes me positively giddy. It does seem a little complicated, said Dorothy, looking dubiously at the wizard's button board. Why, it's perfectly simple, the wizard assured her brightly. All you have to do is touch the right buttons at the right time. But the scarecrow, who had been about to ask another question, whirled round on one heel and flopped on his back in the aisle. The cowardly lion skidded rapidly past to wedge under the little dining table, while Dorothy and the wizard clung to the steering board to keep from falling. For a terrific roar, like the tearing of a gigantic sheet, had made the Ospreil tremble like a leaf. There came a sudden flash of silver smoke and the gradual dying away of all sound. Then, a complete and ominous silence. What? What? Why, it's gone! shouted the wizard, racing over to the door and staring amazedly at the empty space occupied a moment before by the Oztober. Then he glanced up into the starlit expanse of the sky. Gone? Creeping on his hands and knees, the scarecrow peered out to see for himself. Why, what right do they have to go off like that? He demanded, pulling himself up by the door jam. April comes before October and goes before October, too. Fall before spring. Why, that's ridiculous. The Ospreil should have let off. Oh, what will become of them? cried Dorothy in distress, clasping her hands anxiously. I'm sure it was a dreadful mistake. Mistake? moaned the wizard, pushing back his high hat. Worse than that, Dorothy. Why, everything is ruined. Here they've gone off before I even had a chance to show the plane to Ozma. They have no directions, no supplies. They'll crash, smash, or wreck themselves. I intended to teach Nick Tropper to navigate the plan before we started. But... Can't we stop them? Can't we go after them? exclaimed Dorothy, clutching the wizard's coattails. Go after them? Yes, that's the idea. Go after them, of course, panted the wizard, falling over the cowardly lion who was making a stream lion for the door. I, I was just going back for my overshoes, wheezed the lion, slinking rather guiltily into his seat at the wizard's reproachful glance. Stay where you are, the wizard directed sharply. Now then, steady, everybody, steady. Shut that door. Scarecrow, we are about to ascend. The wizard bent over the steering board to touch the green button that would inflate the Ospreil's balloon. But I never expected to go without my black bag of magic, an extra vest, or even my bottle of hair tonic. Haven't you any magic at all? called Dorothy as the Ospreil began to vibrate and tremble from the rush of gas into its balloon. A little, a little, confessed the wizard, pressing the buttons marked up and south. Here, Dorothy, take the telescope and see if you can catch a glimpse of the Oztober when we are aloft. Grasping the wheel, the wizard settled grimly into the pilot's seat. 
Dorothy had just time to clutch the telescope before the Ozpril rose straight into the air. Lifted and borne by its buoyant gas bag, the graceful ship pointed towards the stars. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Schragen. Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter Four: First Flight of the Oztober. Now the start of the Oztober has been nothing like the orderly takeoff of the Ozpril. The first hint Jellia had of their departure was when a china coffee pot from the open china closet, into which she was looking with great interest, hit her with a sharp clip on the chin. Next moment she was rolling round on the floor of the cabin, dodging all the rest of the green dishes. Oh! Oh! Dishes awful! choked poor Jellia Jam, not even realizing she was making a pun. Stop! yelled the tin woodsman turning a complete somersault and coming down on his funnel with one leg hooked through the luggage rack stop who did that pickles moaned a faint voice from the forward end of the cabin oh those pickles and that was probably as correct an answer as any to nick's indignant question even upside down as he was and subject to the fierce rocketing of the plane the tin woodman could see a tall green figure sprawl across the navigator's table as he had bent over to examine the oztober's steering apparatus the soldier with green whiskers had been taken with a violent cramp from the twenty-nine pickles he had eaten at the party falling heavily on the board he had pushed down ten of the wizard's bright colored buttons following the directions of all ten one after the other the oztober had exploded into the air and now whistling and whirring like a comet bound for mars was charging into the heavens jellia jam was too bruised and shaken to do anything but cling to the side of one of the seats the soldier after his head had been whacked down three times on the board had lapsed into complete and utter silence only nick managed to preserve a semblance of his usual calm and composure though severely dented by the plane's takeoff the tin woodman being of metal felt no pain nor was he subject to the giddiness that assailed ordinary flesh and bone bodies under such trying conditions even standing on his head did not greatly inconvenience him and after the first dreadful shock he began to perceive a certain order and rhythm in their flight this was not strange the soldier's fall had pressed down the button to inflate the oztober's balloon the up and the south buttons the fast spin spiral zig zag slow and circle buttons as well so first the oztober would shoot up then it would go into a fast spin and spiral the zigs and zags were a little less terrible and on one of the slow circles the tin woodman managed to extricate his foot from the luggage rack clattering full length in the aisle he lay still till the next slow circle then leaping to his feet he rushed forward and pulled the soldier off the steering board he had just time to prop the unconscious army into the third chair and fall into the pilot's seat himself when the oztober went into another fast spin and spiral this rather upset nick he had taken a hasty look at the navigator's table when he entered the ship and then more interested in the metal of which the plane was constructed had gone tapping about testing it with his tin knuckles intending to return to the steering gear later he naturally had supposed that when he pulled the soldier off the board the plane would slow down or change its course but nothing of the kind happened all the buttons the soldier had fallen on stayed down grasping the wheel nick was relieved to find he could steady the oztober a bit in this way holding to it with one hand he tried to pull out the spin and spiral buttons with the other but even his strong tin fingers could not budge them next he glanced frantically over the board for a stop or a down button but the down button when he found it filled him with apprehension if they shot down at the speed they were hurling upward the plane most certainly would be wrecked no decided nick drawing his fingers hastily back from the down button 
They were much safer in the air until he learned a little more about flying, and he'd just have to hang on till he discovered how the ozoplane worked. Grasping the wheel resignedly in both hands, he glanced back to see how Jellia was faring. Jellia was sitting dizzily in the middle of the aisle, but she was so encouraged to see Nick actually at the wheel that she made her way to him and hung firmly to the arm of his chair. Just then, the Oztober whirled into its twentieth spin and spiral, and Jellia dislodged from the chair, caught at the steering table to save herself from falling. "'Oh, now you've done it!' gasped Nick, as the Oztober gave a wicked lurch. "'Oh, now!' His voice trailed off into a hoarse squeak, for as abruptly as it had started, the plane stopped and held aloft by its still buoyant balloon, swung easily to and fro in the faint wind that stirred above the clouds. "'Say!' How did you do it? Letting go the wheel, the tin woodsman seized Jellia by the shoulders. What? panted Jellia. What did I do? Why, you saved the ship. You stopped her. See, all the buttons are up again. Removing Jellia's clutching fingers gently from the tabletop, Nick discovered a flat bar on the underside of the board. As soon as Jellia pressed the bar, all the buttons had popped back to their normal positions. So that's it! "'So that's it!' exclaimed Nick, rubbing his tin forehead anxiously. "'Each time you want to change the course, you press this bar and then begin all over again.' "'But now we're sinking,' groaned Jellia, and sinking herself into the seat back of Nick, she stared at him with round, desperate eyes. "'Sinking, are we? Well, I'll soon put a stop to that.' Pouncing on the green button to inflate the Oztober's gas bag, Nick pressed it quickly, for, of course, as soon as Jelly had touched the bar, the buttons had all sprung up and the magic gas had begun to seep out of the plane's balloon attachment. As it again filled and became taut, the slow downward drift of the ship ceased, and again it hung motionless between a cloud and a star. Now, breathed the tin woodsman, eyeing the button board with grim purpose and determination, now we can take our time and start off right. Oh, Nick, must we go through that again? Jellia began to cry softly, drying her eyes on the sash of her party dress. Oh, Nick, I never thought flying would be like this. Please, can't we just stay as we are? Certainly not, said the tin woodman briskly. Hanging round the sky is dangerous. We might be hit by a shooting star or even by a meteor. Now just trust yourself to me, my dear Jellia. Remember, I am the Emperor of the East. Nick smote his tin chest a resounding blow. And after ruling the Winkies all these years, I surely can handle one small plane. Reassuring himself, if not Jellia, the tin woodman searched the array of buttons for one marked slow. After he had found it, he began to map his course. He would continue to fly up for a time. Next, he would take a horizontal direction until he grew more accustomed to piloting the ozoplane. Then, as night passed and the sun rose, he would zig and zag slowly downward and make a safe landing near the Emerald City. The soldier with green whiskers had regained consciousness, only to fall at once into a heavy slumber. His snores blended nicely with Jellia's sobs, as Nick Chopper pushed the up, the south, and the slow buttons. Braced for a new shock, Jellia grasped the arms of her seat, but this time the Oztober soared gently and gracefully aloft. The motion of the plane so smooth and pleasant Ozma's little maiden-waiting soon forgot all her fears. Relaxing against the soft green cushions, she too fell asleep. This left only Nick awake and alert, but if the wizard had searched all over Oz, he could not have found a better pilot than the tin woodman. Being practically tireless and requiring neither food nor rest, he could keep his place at the wheel for days if necessary. Delighted at the way the Oztober responded to his clever manipulation of the wheel and buttons, he flew up and up and on and on, scarcely realizing the distance he was putting between himself and Oz. Glancing out the round window beside him, Nick viewed the starry expanse of the upper air with growing interest and enthusiasm. Sometimes he was almost tempted to waken Jellia to point out the splendid cloud mountains and cities they were passing. As he swept along, the sky turned from deep blue to gray and was now suffused with the rainbow tints of early morning. Switching off the lights, the tin woodman slightly changed his course. I really need a lot more practice before I go back or try to make a safe landing, he observed softly to himself. It never would do to crack up a valuable ship like this.
but the truth of the matter was the tin woodman did not wish to turn back and after all who was to insist the soldier angelia still slept on and far ahead between a bank of fog and an arch of platinum sun rays loomed a long lavender crescent nick even fancied he could see people moving about its glittering surface a new world gloated the tin woodman sending his funnel at a more daring angle if this were so he would be its discoverer not only that but he would claim it for ozma and win for himself as much honor and renown as samuel salt the royal explorer of oz even if it's not inhabited it would be a good place to practice landing reflected nick happily so again he pressed the black bar touched the button to deflate the oztober's balloon and raise the wings for now he wished to fly horizontally and the wings would be faster than the gas bag next touching the straight on and faster buttons and twirling the wheel expertly he headed the ship straight for the tip of the lavender island End of chapter 4《ヴォズ・プレイニング・ウィッド・ウィザード・オブ・オズ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas.《ヴォズ・プレイニング・ウィッド・ウィザード・オブ・オズ》by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 5 The Spikers Nick waited until he was well over the crescent before he attempted to land. As he flew along, he planned exactly how he would go about it, and everything worked out as planned except for one thing. The slow, the zig, and the down buttons brought the Oztober within a foot of the glittering air aisle, but the stop button functioned a bit late. Instead of stopping on the surface, the plane dropped clear through with a crash like the smashing of a thousand thin tumblers. Peering up through a spray of splinters, the tin woodman found he had knocked a jagged hole in the crescent. Attention! Shoulder arms! Company fall in! yelled the soldier with the green whiskers. Jolted completely awake, he sprang up in the aisle, aiming his gun at the ceiling. Yes! Yes! Coming, Your Majesty! Jellia, mistaking the musical crash for the ringing of Ozma's morning bell, rolled sleepily out of her seat and started down the aisle after the soldier. Now, now, don't be alarmed! remarked nick chopper i was just trying to land land where is it quick let me out of here panted jellia jam remembering all in a rush where she was and the dreadful experiences of the night before i see no land said the soldier pressing his nose against one of the windows well it certainly looked like land the tin woodman spoke in a slightly exasperated voice the oztober still quivering from its impact with the island was hanging motionless about ten feet below the crescent can't tell about these sky countries till you try them i bet it's nothing but a cake of ice shivered jellia hugging herself to keep warm being of tin i don't suppose you'd notice it was freezing i wonder if that stove lights ice meditated nick as jellia hurried toward the back of the cabin why i do believe you are right my dear in the upper stratas the air does become colder we probably cracked through a frozen cloud. Jellia, turning all the switches on the stove, paid little attention to Nick's scientific discourse. She was too busy warming herself over the glowing burners. If we just had something to cook, sighed the little Oz maid, staring wistfully into the cupboard beside the stove. But the shelves were perfectly empty. Reflecting that the wizard had not had time to stock up for the flight, Jellia, who was an orderly little soul, began picking up the china that had broken when it fell from the cabinet the night before. Rather pompously, the soldier with the green whiskers began to help her. "'Will somebody kindly explain what we are doing, flying around in this dangerous and haphazard manner?' he inquired loftily. "'I understood we were to wait for Ozma's return before we made a trial flight, and really, you know I'm needed at home to guard the castle.' oh indeed sniffed jellia and who do you suppose started us off mr whiskers nobody but yourself a fine pickle you put us in when you fell on that steering board i the soldier straightened up aghast yes you declared jellia you and your pickles sweeping the rest of the broken plates into her skirt she marched to the end of the cabin and dumped them into the big basket beside the water cooler goodness knows whether we shall ever get back she sighed sinking despondently into the last seat and staring out the window but we're backing now muttered the soldier this was quite true for nick to avoid hitting the crescent of ice again was manoeuvring the plane from beneath 
then feeling it might be dangerous to go any higher he began slowly and cautiously to descend neither he nor jellia paid any more attention to the soldier with the green whiskers who glanced uncomfortably from one to the other after a little silence he remarked in a hollow voice i shall consider myself under arrest i shall walk guard for two hours without pause for rest or rations oh don't be a goose giggled jellia you'll probably go without rations because there aren't any but what good will walking guard do as commander-in-chief i have sentenced myself to walk guard as a first-class private in the army of oz i shall carry out this sentence insisted the soldier discipline must be maintained hoisting his old-fashioned blunderbuss to his shoulder he began tramping stiffly up and down the short aisle of the cabin born in a small munchkin village to a family named battles who had promptly christened him want to win he had applied as soon as he was grown for a position in the army of oz the wizard then supreme ruler of the kingdom impressed by the soldier's height and long green whiskers had immediately hired him later he had been promoted by ozma to fill the position of the entire staff and army of oz wantowin had never been much of a fighter but as war in oz is practically outlawed and victories usually won by magic he had got on very well at his tenth about face wantowin suddenly recalled the piece of cake he had stuffed into his pocket the night before and generously offered it to jellia oh wanny how wonderful to the famished girl the cake tasted even better than it had at the wizard's party breaking it in half she tried to force the soldier to eat a piece but raising his hand sternly wantowin continued his self-imposed sentence seeing argument was useless jellia ate her own share and put the other half in the cupboard for the soldier's supper the plane was still slanting smoothly downward after oiling all of nick's joints and thinking how fortunate it was that they had brought along the oil can jellia began marching up and down behind the soldier examining the pictures and charts on the wall as she went along the cake and a long drink of water from the cooler had done much to restore her courage and cheerfulness and an occasional glance out the window was both pleasant and reassuring the oztober was dropping through fluffs and puffs of creamy cloud just like whipped cream on strawberries if we had any strawberries mused jellia withdrawing her gaze reluctantly from the window and resuming her march oh nick here are some directions she cried suddenly stopping before a finely printed notice beside the water cooler directions the tin woodman looked round rather annoyed he felt he had almost mastered the mechanism of the ozoplane and did not care to start a new system but the directions that jellia read off had nothing to do with the navigation of the plane they were rules for the behaviour of passengers in the strat the air in this cabin has been magically treated stated the notice so long as the windows and doors are closed riders may safely pass through the highest stratas on debarking however it would be well to don my patent protective air helmets see chest beneath second seat or to take one for each mile up of my eleutherated altitude pills from the recess in the table leg jellia whose bump of curiosity was larger than most lost no time in hunting for the helmets dragging the chest from beneath the second seat and paying no attention to the marching soldier who stepped over her each time he passed she impatiently lifted the lid the four helmets in the chest were of some pliant glassy material resembling cellophane they belted in at the waist and after holding one up for nick's inspection jellia put them back and returned the chest to its place now which leg of which table pondered the little maid in waiting her mind turning to the altitude pills oh what does it matter grinned the tin woodman as jellia crawled under the navigator's table and began tapping its legs one after the other you'll soon be on solid earth and won't need altitude pills nick had made up his mind to bring the oztober down to a landing wherever they happened to be but jellia scarcely heard him for at that moment she had discovered a small hook on one of the front legs of the table pulling it down she disclosed a tall triangular bottle in the hollow centre the pills were triangular too and of every colour in the rainbow take one after each mile read jellia uncorking the bottle and taking a good sniff the pills smelled as good as they looked and she was about to sample one when the soldier with the green whiskers gave a hoarse scream and such a leap that his head hit the ceiling now what's the matter demanded nick chopper turning round stiffly while jellia hastily corked the bottle shoved it back into the table leg and crawled into the aisle nick shrieked poor jellia what is it what are they oh ozma oh wizard oh help help 
and well might Jellia scream, for swarming around the tail of the Oztober came a perfect horde of iridescent monsters. In shape, each resembled an octopus, but instead of arms they had long, horny spikes and spines. Pressing close to the plane, they ogled at the shivering passengers as if they were fish in some strange aquarium. Then, evidently angered at what they saw, they began hurling and banging themselves against the sides of the Oztober, till it sounded like the rattle of machine guns. At this juncture, I am sorry to report, want to win battles, after sounding a shrill retreat on the bugle attached to his belt, rushed into the dressing room and wrapped himself in the shower curtain. Nick Chopper, who already loved the wizard's ship as if it were his own, shuddered as each spike struck the shining metal. Then, deciding that flight was the better part of valour, he hastily changed course, zooming up and up, faster and faster and faster. For perhaps a thousand feet, the goggle-eyed monsters pursued them, but at last the air grew too thin and rare for the spikers, and one by one they fell away. Their horrid squeals and screeches still came faintly to the three voyagers, and Jellia ran quickly to the back window to stare down after them. "'Why, I never knew there were wild animals in the air!' stuttered Jellia, blinking her eyes rapidly. "'No, I wouldn't exactly call them wild animals,' said Nick argumentatively, twisting his neck from side to side to be sure he was not rusting. "'Well, they certainly weren't birds,' declared Jellia indignantly. "'And how did they fly without wings?' Come on out, soldier. They're gone. Aha! So, we have won. Jauntily, the soldier stepped out of the dressing room and resumed his marching. Give me credit for sounding the retreat, comrades, he observed cheerfully. Jellia sniffed, and Nick Chopper said nothing. What are we going to do now? inquired the little Ozmaid, going over to stand by the wheel. How can we ever fly down with those awful creatures below? We'll just travel horizontally till we're out of their area, Nick told her complacently. But, for a while, anyway, we'll go up. After all, one has to go up to come down, you know. And when we do come down... Nick gave a satisfied little nod. It will be in a safe spot, and far from those spiky animals. Oh, so that's what they are. But how did you know? Jellia looked admiringly at the tin woodman. Oh, it just came to me, admitted Nick with a modest cough. Beasts of the air must have names, I suppose. Make a note of those monsters, will you want to win? "'I'm writing them up in my little green book now,' mumbled the soldier, who was, in fact, scribbling away hastily as he tramped up and down. "'I've made a sketch of one, too.' "'Good, although I didn't suppose you'd looked at them long enough for that,' said Nick, a bit sarcastically. He glanced hastily at the page the soldier held before his nose. Then, deciding they had flown high enough, he pointed the Oztober towards the east, and after an hour's leisurely flying again began a slow and cautious descent. "'I do wonder where we'll land,' mused Jellia, trying to pierce with her bright eyes the bank of fog that lay beneath. "'Somewhere in the quadling country, I should judge,' answered Nick, twirling the wheel deftly to the right. "'And when we do—' At that instant the soldier with the green whiskers let out another panicky squawk. "'Climb! Climb!' he panted, running up and down the aisle so fast he almost ran himself down on the about faces. "'We're ambushed, comrades. Fire in the fog. Land on the stern.' "'Oh, tin cups and canyons,' rasked Nick Chopper, losing his temper at last. "'If this keeps up, how are we ever to get down? Hammer and tong it. Something's always getting in the way. Will you stop that silly marching?' he yelled, snatching at the soldier's sleeve as he raced by. "'Halt!' quavered Want to Win. Instantly obeying his own command, he stood trembling beside the navigator's table as Nick peered desperately down through the fog. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson Chapter 6 Strut of the Strat What is it, Hippenscop? Stratuvius the Seventh looked up impatiently as his first and fastest messenger came to a panting halt under the imperial canopy. Instead of answering, Hippenscop, his chest heaving and his eyes bulging, made a wordless gesture over his shoulder. Then, catching his foot in the royal boot-scraper, he fell violently up the steps of the dais. This was not unusual, for anyone who falls in Stratovania falls up instead of down. 
Rather relieved to find himself before the throne at last, Hippenscop scrambled to his feet. Sucking in his breath, he announced hoarsely, I beg to report a strange and sonorbious monster falling through the fog over Half Moon Lake. Are you sure it is not a Zuma? Throwing down the morning star which he had been reading, Stratuvius stared coldly at the messenger. Oh no, no, no! Hippenscop shook his head positively. It has wings and a tail, your strategy. Wings, a tail, and seven eyes. But hark! The menacing whir and sputter following the messenger's speech made even the ruler of all the Stratovanians leap off his throne. Striding rapidly after the terrified servitor, Strut, followed by half the inhabitants of his irradiant tip toposphere, reached the shores of Half Moon Lake. Sky Dragon! he announced, after a brief glance at the gleaming shape drifting down through the fog. Quick, Hippen, summon the royal blowman. Back, stand back, you witless woffs. Do you wish to be crushed and eaten? Yon monster will alight on the north shore any moonlight now. At Strut's loud warning, half of his subjects took to their heels, while the rest scurried round to the south side of the lake, every head turned up towards the mysterious dragon. Only, of course, it was not a dragon. It was the silver-bodied Oztober, inside of which the agitation was almost as great as the alarm of the airlanders below. "'How long have we? How long will it be before we land?' gulped Jellia. Remembering the wizard's instructions, she jerked out the box of air helmets, and next made a dive under the navigator's table. "'Here, take one, two, three. Oh, how many shall we take?' groaned the little Oz maid, holding up the bottle of altitude pills. One after each mile up. But how many miles have we come? One hundred and one thousand eight hundred and sixty-seven feet, mumbled the soldier with the green whiskers, reading the figures from a shining metal hypsometer clamped to the navigator's table. All we have to do is figure how many feet in a mile. Fifty-two hundred and some, puffed Nick, working away desperately at his wheel and buttons to bring the Oztober down without crashing. Oh, take twenty he directed sharply, as Jellia and the soldier stood regarding him with open mouths. It was no time, as Jellia later told Ozma, to be doing long division. With trembling fingers, she counted out twenty pills for the soldier with green whiskers. Then, popping twenty into her own mouth and crunching them desperately between her teeth, she handed the bottle to Nick Chopper. No, no, none for me. The tin woodman waved the bottle impatiently aside. High altitude won't injure my metal, but keep this oil can handy, Jellia, and whatever happens, don't let me rust. Choking on the pills which were dry and rather bitter, Jellia nodded earnestly. Tucking the oil can into the little bag that hung from her wrist, she began nervously dragging on her air helmet. Want to win battles had already adjusted his and swallowed his pills. Now, peering out one of the round windows, he trembled so violently all of his weapons rattled and clanked to the dismal tune of his fright. The thousands of them, quavered the soldier. What kind of place is this, anyway? It's so bright it hurts my eyes. Oh, I just know they'll be fighting. Look, I'd far better stay in the cabin, as someone must guard the plane. But not you. Nick Chopper spoke with great firmness then spinning the wheel rapidly and gauging to a nicety the distance between the ship and the sparkling aerosphere, he touched the down and stop buttons simultaneously. Coasting down the last little hill of wind, the Oztober came to a gentle and complete stop on the shore of a rainbow-hued body of water. Now, now, take your time, cautioned the tin woodman, as Jellia started impulsively towards the door. Pulling off one of the cushion covers, Nick began polishing himself vigorously. As the discoverer of this new and astonishing airland, he wished to make a good impression. From what he had seen, it was a country well worth claiming for Ozma of Oz. Here, let me go first, he said, tossing aside the cushion cover. Keep close to me, Jellia. And soldier, under no circumstances are you to retreat unless I give the signal. Great tin hoppers, what was that? A long wail, rather like the squall of a cat, suddenly had rent the quiet air of the cabin. "'Stow away!' cried Jellia, as another unmistakable meow followed the first. "'Sounds like Dorothy's cat!' But it was not Eureka that Jellia pulled from behind the second seat cushion. It was a small black kit bag. The green eyes turned off and on like electric lights, and the tail curved over the back to form a handle. Round its neck hung a green placard. 
this kit bag of magic to be used only in cases of extreme emergency to open pull the tail whiz well gee whiz is this an emergency jellia held the bag out nervously uh yes declared nick chopper after a second glance out the window bring it along and remember you have nothing to fear i the emperor of all the winkies am with you with kind words and courteous gestures we will win the friendship and allegiance of these strange airlanders for ozma of oz jellia knew nick's red plush heart given him by the wizard was the kindest in all oz nevertheless she took a firmer hold on the kit bag and only after assuring herself that want to win had his saber and blunderbuss did she follow the tin woodman down the oztober's ladder there was a complete and astonished silence as the three Ozians stepped from the plane, and, it must be confessed, Jellia and the soldier in their transparent helmets, and the tin woodman without a helmet, was strange enough to startle any airbody. So it's no wonder the Stratovanians were as amazed at the appearance of the travellers as the travellers were amazed at the Stratovanians. Separated only by the waters of Half Moon Lake, they confronted each other with growing alarm strut who had expected this dragon to roar spurt flames and then rush forward to attack them hardly knew what to do when these three curious beings stepped from the monster's interior noting with alarm that his blowman had not yet arrived he determined to hold the invaders in conversation if possible so with his head and chest high and walking with the queer strutting gait that characterized all of the dwellers in stratovania he advanced slowly around the edge of half moon lake a few paces behind strutted the rest of his retainers just as slowly nick chopper and his two companions advanced to meet them the airlanders were a head taller than even the tin woodman their hair grew straight up on end sparkling and crackling with electricity in a really terrifying manner their eyes were star-shaped and shaded by long silver lashes the noses and mouths were straight and firm the foreheads transparent some shone as from a hidden sun while across the brows of others tiny black clouds chased one another in rapid succession watching their foreheads would be a good way decided jellia jam to find out whether they were pleased or angry strut and his subjects wore belted tunics of some iridescent rainbow-hued material and silver sandals laced to the knee from the ears of the men hung huge crescent pendants while from those of the women star earrings danced and dangled each Stratovanian carried a tall staff tipped with wings. Beyond, Jellia saw a country of such dazzling beauty she was almost afraid to breathe lest it vanish before her eyes. The trees were tall and numerous, with gleaming prism-shaped trunks and a mass of cloud-like foliage. Some bore fruit that actually seemed to be illuminated, oranges, pears and peaches glowing like decorated electric light bulbs. Moon and star flowers grew in great profusion, and in the distance caves and grottoes of purest crystal scintillated in the high noon sun so far as jellia could see there were no houses or castles but there were hundreds of gay canopies held up by crystal poles jellia was just standing on tiptoe to glimpse the furnishings of the nearest canopy when nick chopper feeling the time had come to speak raised his tin arm and called out imperiously i emperor of the east and the winkies hereby claim this new and beautiful aerosphere for ozma of oz and bid you its illustrious inhabitants pledge to her your allegiance at the same time i bestow upon all of you upper aryans free citizenship in the glorious land of oz at this bold speech strut stopped and stood as if rooted to the spot not only was he dumbfounded to discover he could understand the language of these curious beings but if what he heard were correct they were actually claiming his kingdom for their own well how was that whispered nick looking down sideways at jellia terrible terrible moaned the little oz maid oh my we'd better look out catching hold of wantowin's hand for he already showed signs of retreating she looked anxiously at the approaching airman black clouds were simply racing across his imperial brow his eyes flashed red and blue lights and his hair positively crackled with indignation and fury oh my i do hope you are feeling well ventured jellia as strut took an enormous stride toward them if you have a headache or anything we could easily come back tomorrow stand where you are sneered strut 
Looking over his shoulder, he made sure his twenty tall blowmen had arrived, and were pushing their way through the crowd. "'Stand where you are, or I'll have you blown to atoms!' "'Now, now, let us not come to blows,' begged Nick Chopper. "'We have much to learn from you, and you from us, and I assure you we have come in the spirit of highest friendship.' "'Humph! So that's what it is. A friendship. Looks like a dragon to me.' Folding his arms, Strut scowled past the three travellers to where the Oztober rested like some giant butterfly on the shore of Half Moon Lake. Then, making a secret signal to the blowmen who had lined up before him, he shouted fiercely, "'I am Strut of the Strat, and supreme ruler of all the upper areas. In daring to claim Stratovania for your foolish countrywoman, you indeed aim high, and will go, I promise you, still higher.' Three blasts and a toot, men. As Strut issued this cruel command, his twenty stern-looking warriors lifted their curved horns and puffed out their cheeks for a tremendous blow. Jellia Jam, feeling that if they ever needed help it was right here and now, frantically sought with her one free hand to open the wizard's kit bag. As she fumbled with the curved handle, Strut raised his long arm. Wait, he cried tensely. Not yet. Lowering their horns and exhaling their breaths in loud whistles, the blowmen stared at him in surprise. Strut had been examining the strangers from Oz more attentively. Now he strode over to Jellia, jerked off her helmet, and ran his hand slowly over her smooth brown hair. Jellia, expecting to faint or expire without the helmet, let out a piteous groan. But the altitude pills were evidently powerful enough to protect her and feeling no ill effects, she glanced up timidly at the towering Stratovanian. Dark clouds no longer flitted across his brow. Indeed, he looked almost pleasant. "'Very pretty,' he mused, stroking Jellia's hair softly. "'Not wiry or stand-uppish like ours. Hippenscop, summon Her Majesty the Queen. She'll be delighted with this beautiful little creature. But it is my intention to blow away these other insolent invaders from Oz.' keeping only this smooth-haired lassie for our Starina. "'Oh, no! Oh, no!' begged Jellia, pulling back with all her strength. "'Stop! You can't have Jellia!' yelled Nick Chopper, flinging out his arms. "'Ready! Aim! Fire!' quavered the soldier with the green whiskers, and pointing his ancient gun at Strut, he valiantly pulled the trigger. But Wantowin's aim was very bad. The twenty marbles with which the gun was loaded zipped harmlessly past the airman's ears, stinging quite a few of his subjects and frightening at least fifty into full flight. Strut himself was not impressed. Giving Nick a push that sent him sprawling and the soldier a shove, he drew Jellia firmly away from her friends. Terrified as she was, the little Oz maid could not help a small thrill of satisfaction to have been chosen by a monarch as high and mighty as Strut of the Strat to be Starina to him and his queen. "'As for you two, said Strut to Nick and the soldier, "'blowing up is quite painless, I assure you, and if you ever do come down, you'll doubtless have many interesting things to tell.' The blowman placed a guard around Nick and the soldier and stepped back to their posts. Nick Chopper and Wantowin, stunned by the swiftness of events, stared sadly at their little Jellia as the blowmen for a second time raised their horns. But Strut, intent on his warriors, had dropped Jellia's hand. Quick as a flash, she pulled the kit bag's tail and pulled out the first object her fingers closed on. It was a small green trumpet. Without stopping to think or reason, Jellia placed it to her lips and blew three frantic toots. Instantly, a light green vapour flowed from the mouth of the horn, spreading like a fast-moving cloud over the entire assemblage. A light green vapour accompanied by three musical notes. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 7. A Most Reluctant Starina. As the last note died away in a sweet, reluctant echo, Strut's blowmen threw down their horns. With wild shouts and cheers, they began to embrace as if each were the other's long-lost brother. The behaviour of the rest of the Stratovanians was equally puzzling. 
they sang they whistled they laughed and stamped their feet from sheer gaiety strut hurrying over to nick chopper shook him heartily by the hand say hey hooray how are you he demanded exuberantly how are you and all of your aunts uncles and infant nieces Wha what's that sputtered nick chopper completely taken aback by this sudden show of friendliness kabebe the queen tears of joy streaming down her moon-shaped face seized the hands of the soldier with the green whiskers and was dancing him round and round unnoticed in the general hubbub and hilarity jellia managed to steal another glance at the green trumpet printed in white letters on the handle was this surprising sentence this trumpet contains cheer gas cheer gas with a tremulous sigh for the last few moments had been a great strain Jellia slipped the wizard's instrument back into the kit bag and zipped it shut. Strangely enough, the gas had not affected any of the people from Oz. In fact, Jellia had never felt less like cheering in her whole life. This way, ray ray, hooray! shouted Strut, who now had Nick by one arm and the soldier by the other. Quickly, go and prepare the guest canopies, Queen Kabebe. These travellers are doubtless weary and need rest and refreshment. Have you any preference as to canopies? he inquired, leaning down to look in Nick Chopper's face. "'Do you have any tin canopies?' asked Nick hoarsely. He was still dazed by Strut's unaccountable change of manner. "'I always feel safer under a tin roof. It is such a beautiful and dependable metal.' "'Tin? Ha 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 ha!' Strut blinked his star eyes rapidly. "'I'm afraid we have no tin, but any other kind, my dear.' "'Nick Chopper, Tin Woodman of Oz,' put in Jellia, who felt it was high time they were properly introduced. And there, she hastily indicated the soldier with the green whiskers, there is Wantowin Battles, the Grand Army of Oz. At Jellia's introduction, Wantowin dropped Strut's arm to shake hands. And who are you, my lovely little Skylark? he questioned. Oh, I'm just Jellia Jam, Ozma's chief maid-in-waiting, Jellia said, as she trotted uneasily along at his side. The rest of the Stratovanians, still cheering and singing, but in a more subdued way, came streaming after them. Rather anxiously, Jellia wondered how long the effects of the cheer gas would last, and how soon Strut would remember about blowing Nick and the soldier away again. It seemed unlikely that she would have another chance to open the kit bag without detection. The Queen, who had not been as cheered by the gas as the others, seemed somewhat unfriendly as she walked along behind her royal husband. Every few minutes, in fact, she would lean forward and give Jellia a spiteful pinch. Jellia bore this rude treatment with extreme patience, making no complaint or outcry, and merely walking a little faster to keep out of the creature's way. Jellia wanted to see all she could of this wonderful, sparkling airland, so she could tell Ozma and Dorothy all about it when she returned to Oz. The soldier with the green whiskers had fallen back to a place beside Queen Kabebe, and was gazing about him with contemptuous snorts. Any country that was not green, like the land surrounding the Emerald City, held no interest for him. Noticing that Jellia was faring quite well without her helmet, and finding his rather stuffy, he took it off and slung it over one shoulder. As he did so, he caught the Queen in the very act of pinching Jellia. Disgusted by such conduct, he sternly took her arm, and each time Kabebe pinched Jellia, the soldier would slap her fingers. After the fifth slap, the queen peered at him with astonished admiration, for on this whole tip-toposphere there was no man bold enough to strike a member of the reigning family. Soon, Kabebe was so fascinated by Wantowin's flowing green whiskers, she forgot all about pinching Jellia. By this time, the strange and still faintly cheering procession had reached Strut's royal canopy. Waving away his giggling blowmen, Strut lifted Jellia to one of the splendid star thrones. To Kabebe, King Strut spoke impatiently. Don't you remember you were about to see about the guest canopies? Kabebe dared not object, but looked quite displeased. Just tell Bitsy Whittle to bring us a tray of air aids and a wind pudding, ordered Strut, giving the Queen a jovial shove to help her on her way. You'd like an air aid, wouldn't you, little lady? Poor Jellia shook her head no, and then quickly changed it to yes. The furnishings of the royal pavilion were so rich and dazzling, and the star throne so high and grand, that she felt completely bewildered. As Kabebe shuffled away, Jellia smiled nervously at Nick and the soldier. 
at strutt's invitation they had seated themselves cross-legged on bright blue air cushions and looked as uncomfortable as they felt well what do you think of stratovania by now inquired strutt settling back complacently i believe you will all enjoy high life as much as we do once you are used to it nick chopper was on the point of saying that they had no intention of getting used to it or of staying one single moment longer than was positively necessary when he caught jellia's worried expression and muttered instead beautiful very beautiful but where are the houses asked the soldier with the green whiskers bluntly these tent tops are all right for a war or for field sports but i should think you'd find them rather chilly for all year round living stratovania explained strut as he crossed his long legs is never chilly it is surrounded by a rim of warm air that keeps the temperature just as you find it today no wind no rain no storms of any kind he concluded proudly and it's all so bright and shiny sighed jellia jam blinking down at the floor of the pavilion which was an inlay of sparkling glass and then off to the countless bright canopies that dotted the airscape beyond the surface of strutt's curious skyland was of gleaming crystal sometimes smooth as ice sometimes rough and rocky but always flashing with the brilliance of diamonds everything sparkles so finished jellia rather wishing she had brought her dark glasses that's because stratovania is formed of solid air smiled strut tapping one of the iridescent posts that supported the silken canopy over their heads and i am its high and mighty sovereign ruler of the spikers who inhabit the strata below and of the zoomers who inhabit the strata above and of all the other spheres and half spheres in this particular area strut of the strat consider that little one and be proud that you have been chosen to be our starina but jellia can't stay here cried the soldier with the green whiskers springing indignantly to his feet jellia's tut tut now do not excite yourself here comes bitsy whittle and we'll all have a glass of liquid air as strutt leaned forward to speak to his small electric haired page jellia shook her head sharply at nick and the soldier for both seemed on the point of dragging her off the throne wait jellia formed the words soundlessly and with puzzled frowns her two friends sank back on their air cushions accepting rather glumly the sparkling goblets of air aid from the light-footed servitor with the air aid bitsy whittle passed heaping saucers of wind pudding a fluffy cloud-like confection that made jellia's mouth positively water you will find the diet here light but nourishing strutt informed them blandly our atmosphere is so rare and exhilarating we need little but sun and starlight to keep us going but now friends i propose a toast to jellia our new starina as nick and wantowin rose unwillingly to their feet for the whole affair struck them as perfectly preposterous strutt lifted his glass and downed his air aid then the soldier rather sulkily drank his nick who never partook of food or drink of any kind set his goblet on a small tabaret and stared sadly at jellia jam the tin woodman feared she was seriously considering strutt's proposal jellia surmised what nick was thinking but as there was no way of explaining that she was just trying to gain time till they could find some way to escape she smiled wanly back at him and swallowed her own air aid suddenly jellia felt herself rising into the air before she could utter a sound her head was pressed tightly against the top of the canopy then dizzily she began to float round and round just like a pretty balloon just let off its string ho ho roared strutt our air aid has made you light-headed molass but wait i'll fetch you down he tapped the winged staff he held in his right hand sharply on the floor instantly it spread its wings carrying him up beside jellia grasping her hand he drew her down to the throne there he chuckled handing her a heavy glass globe to hold that will weigh you down reflecting that one of these winged sticks might be a handy thing to have jellia clutched the glass globe still weak and giddy from her flight she could not bring herself to touch the wind pudding bitsy whittle had placed on the arm of the throne the soldier with the green whiskers on account of his heavy weapons and boots had not gone so high as jellia but even he instead of sitting on his air cushion was now seated on nothing three feet above nick chopper's head he looked extremely unhappy as indeed he was don't worry grinned strutt who seemed highly amused by the whole affair you'll come down presently he tapped his winged staff on the head as he spoke and the staff immediately folded its wings tell me 
he urged, turning to Nick Chopper, who was looking anxiously from the soldier to Jellia. Do you come from below, or be high? Uh, be oath, answered the tin woodman, too confused by this time to know what he was saying. Taking off from the emerald city of Oz, we first flew up, then over, then up, and next down. Hmm, Oz. Two very black clouds floated across Strut's transparent brow. I seem to remember you mentioning Oz before. I seem to remember. Strut's voice was no longer pleasant, and watching his brow growing blacker and blacker, Jellia frantically sought to open the wizard's kit bag. Unless she could release some more of the cheer gas, almost anything might happen. Out of the third point of his left star eye, Strut saw what she was doing. Don't fidget, my dear, he snapped crossly. It is unbecoming for our new Starina of Stratovania to fidget, or to unpack her own bag. Here. Taking the kit bag from her, he tossed it carelessly beneath his throne. Jellia's heart sank. She hoped Nick would say no more about claiming Stratovania for Ozma. But the Tin Woodman, already launched upon a glowing description of their famous fairyland, was working up to that very point. One hundred and one thousand, eight hundred and sixty-seven feet below this aerosphere, began Nick, taking a long breath, lies the great, grand, and incomparable fairyland of Oz. Oblong in shape, it is divided into four triangular kingdoms. The northern and purple land of the Gillikins is ruled by Joe King. The blue western land of the Munchkins by His Majesty King Cheeriobed. The eastern yellow land of the Winkies is governed by myself. The southern red land of the Quadlings by Glinda the Good Sorceress. But all of us are subject to the benign rule of Ozma, the young fairy ruler of the whole kingdom. Her capital, the Emerald City in the exact centre of Oz, is one of the most beautiful cities out of the world. Surrounding Oz and protecting it from invasions is a deadly desert, and in Ozma's possession are more jewels and treasure than you doubtless have seen in the whole of your air existence. Humph, growled Strut, looking fiercer than ever. But paying no heed to the ominous storm clouds forming on his brow, Nick loftily proceeded. Not only is Ozma possessed of more jewels than any other sovereign known, but in her castle are magical appliances that make her the most powerful of rulers. For instance, Ozma has a magic belt with which she can transport anyone anywhere. On her wall hangs a magic picture in which she can see what is happening to her friends or foes right while it is happening. In her safe is a magic fan to blow away her enemies, and so many other strange instruments of magic I have not time to describe them. Among her advisers is the famous Wizard of Oz, who spends all his time studying magic and perfecting new inventions. The Ozoplane in which we made this perilous flight is his latest masterpiece. And now that you know a bit more of Ozma and her famous country, I'm sure you will be delighted to become a part of our happy realm and acknowledge Ozma as the supreme sovereign of Stratovania. What? screamed Strut, bounding off his throne and furiously confronting the Tin Woodman. How dare you suggest such a thing? This is the second time you have done so. Why should I, Strut of the Strat, acknowledge this miserable Earthlander as my supreme anything? I am a thousand times richer and more important than any below lander below. Oz, Oz indeed. As Nick backed off in some alarm, Strut shook his long staff over the tin woodman's head. Why, you can't even pronounce the name of your own country, he sneered. It is not Oz, as you say it, but O's, the zone of O's, to be more correct. And if O's is in the zone of O's, it is ozone, which means air, and that makes it belong to me. So I, Strut of the Strat, hereby do claim Ozonia for myself and my people, and you, my fine Mr. Funneltop, shall take me there. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Ozo Planning with the Wizard of Oz」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pseudonymous Nerd Chapter 8 The Strat of Strat Sets Off for Oz Don't you do it! Don't you do it! Plumping down on his air cushion, for the effects of air eight had worn off at last. The soldier with green whiskers wildly sounded retreat on his green bugle. Jellia, knowing he would run as fast as he could 
and perhaps wreck the ozo plane before she and Nick could reach it, jumped off her throne and seized him by the coat tails. As she did so, Strut gave the glass gong beside him a resounding whack. Gong! Before any of the three travellers could take another step, the twenty blowmen tramped back into the royal pavilion. The cheer engendered by the cheer gas had entirely evaporated by now, and they looked very grim indeed. At a signal from Strut, one seized Nick, a second the soldier, and a third was about to take hold of Jellia, when Strut sternly waved him aside. No, not that one. She is our new Starina, he told the blowman roughly. Now you are to stay here, Jellia, my dear, and help rule over Stratovania while I descend to Oz and take possession of that rich and prosperous country. And sooner than soon I will return, bringing you the magic treasure and the jewels and the crown and the scepter of this Ozma. Oh, but you mustn't, wailed Jellia, clasping her hands desperately. Ozma is a real princess and much more beautiful than I. In that case, I shall bring Ozma and make her a starina also. Now, hip and scop, he directed, shaking his finger at the odd-looking page. You and John and Rupp are to obey Jellia in everything. I'll leave three blowmen here to protect our starina. The others and all of my able-bodied fighters shall fly with me to Oz. The Ozo Queen holds only four, cried Jellia, looking desperately over at Nick, who was struggling angrily to free himself from the blowmen. But they had his arms pinioned behind his back, and the poor tin woodman was unable to help himself. Oh, that's all right, answered Strut. I am the tin guy, will ride in the French ship, and the others will follow on their flying sticks, and soon I shall return with all the treasures of us. As the blowmen started away, leaving Nick and the soldier ahead of them, Jellia felt so frightened and alone that she burst into tears. <laughs> oh, please, please, couldn't you leave soldier to keep me company? <laughs> she sobbed, wiping her streaming eyes on her sack. Of course, of course, if you wish. Motioning to the blowmen, they picked up Wantowin as if he had been a sack of potatoes and tossed him roughly back into the royal pavilion. He landed with a clatter at Jellia's feet. But, but see here, I'm not sure I can find a way back to Oz, protested Nick as Chuck fell into step at his side. I happened upon this aerosphere by merest chance. I have no idea in which direction Oz now lies. Just the same, I think you will take me there. Strut grinned wickedly, tapping Nick on the shoulder with his staff. He already had sent Jan and Rupp to summon the army, and glancing over his shoulder, Nick saw a thousand young airmen strutting along behind them. As they came into the shores, Hippenscop came panting and gasping. His Skyness, the new Starina, paid me to give you this, he puffed, handing the tin woodman the small oil can the wizard had given him at the party. Nick had forgotten all about his oil can, and was, without it he was likely to rust and become perfectly helpless. Taking it thankfully, he headed reluctantly for Ostober. Nick had no intention of flying strut to the Emerald City. Even if he had to wreck the plane, he would find some way of keeping that greedy airman and his army from conquering Oz. Then he would return and rescue Jellia and the soldier. But without a word to strut, for argument at this point would have been useless, he mounted the ladder and walked through the cosy cabin and seated himself on the pilot's chair. Strut paused on the top rung of the ladder before he entered. Follow us closely, men, he commanded. No matter how far or how fast we fly. Strut's young warriors understood and with a few final directions, the Stratovanian stepped over the sill, 
slammed the door of the Ostober and walked rapidly forward, examining everything with lively interest. So this dragon body really flies, he said, bending curiously over the navigator's table. Ho, oh, what's this? I thought you told me there was no way of finding your route back. Nick Chopper, even more surprised than Strut, picked up the tidy map that lay on top of the buttons. It had certainly not been there before, but here it was now, showing the complete course they had taken since leaving Emerald City. Concluding that this was some of the wizard's magic, Mick examined the map attentively. Each turn, up or down, each mile east or west was charted accurately. All you have to do now is follow this in reverse, exclaimed Strut. Unaccustomed though he was to flying except by star, he was nevertheless sharp enough to realize the value of a good map when he saw one. And remember now, no tricks, he warned sternly. Land me safely in Oz and you will be suitably rewarded. But land me anywhere else and you will be completely obliterated. Nick said nothing. Wary of Strut's threats and boasts, the woodman touched the button to inflate Ostober's balloon and the up, south and fast buttons. In the whirl and splutter of their takeoff, the airlander's further remarks and directions were completely drowned out. End of chapter 8 of Ozo Planning with the Wizard of Oz Chapter 9 of Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Ozoplaning with the Wizard of Oz by Ruth Plumley Thompson. Chapter 9 Jellia in a Frightful Jam. For a long time after the departure of the Tin Woodman and of Strut and his legions, Jellia sat forlornly on the star throne trying to stem the tears that coursed slowly down her cheeks. To be stranded on this high and dangerous aerosphere was bad enough, but the thought of Strut flying off to destroy Ozma and steal all her treasures was more frightening still. "'What on earth shall we do?' questioned Jellia with a rueful smile, of the soldier with green whiskers, who was tramping morosely up and down the pavilion. Halting in his march, Wantowin shook his head dubiously. "'That I cannot say,' he murmured, taking off his cap and staring gloomily inside. "'I have no standing in this country at all. But you, Jellia, are a starina. Therefore you must decide what is to be done. And whatever your Majesty's orders may be, I will carry them out to the letter. To the letter,' declared Wantowin, standing up very straight and tall. "'Oh, bother my Majesty!' scolded Jellia. You know perfectly well I didn't ask to be a starina of this terrible place. It is not what you want, but what you are that counts, insisted the soldier stubbornly. And there's no getting around it. Jellia, you are a starina. So while you are deciding what is to be done, I'll just do a bit of reconnoitering. It might be well to know the lay of the air. Wait, cried Jellia, as one to win started smartly down the steps. "'Whatever you do, Wanny, don't run,' she implored earnestly. "'You might easily run off the edge, and then where'd you be? "'So do please be careful, and if anything frightens you, run straight back here. "'Do you promise?' "'Nothing ever frightens me,' said the soldier in an offended voice. "'Marching sternly down the steps, he was off at double-quick, "'without even a glance over his shoulder. "'Feeling more alone than ever, Jellia sighed and folded her hands in her lap.' But Wantowin's words, foolish as they were, had done her good. After all, she was a starina, for the time being, anyway. So straightening her crown and drying her tears, Jellia tried to think how she should act under such bewildering circumstances. How would Ozma act, for instance, if she were sitting on the throne of this singular air tree? Even thinking of the gentle and dignified little girl ruler of Oz steadied Jellia. Holding her head very high, she stepped down from the dais and began pacing slowly up and down the pavilion, switching her green skirts in such a regal manner that the two messengers who had returned quietly to their posts stared at her with new interest and admiration. "'Is there anything we might bring your strategy?' asked Junnenrump, bowing from the waist and clicking his heels together smartly. 
At his question, Jellia paused and eyed the two speculatively. Why, yes, she decided after a moment's thought. You, Jun and Rump, may send someone to amuse me, and you, Hippenscop, may bring me two of those winged staffs. It is neither safe nor proper for a Starina and her army to be without them. But your Skyness! Hippenscop leaped into the air and spun round and round in an agony of embarrassment. There are no extra staffs, he blurted, finally coming to a stop before her. The little fellow looked so distressed, Jelly was on the point of letting him off. Then, remembering just in time that she was bound to be obeyed, she raised her arm. Go, she commanded haughtily, and do not return without two winged staffs. Junnenrump already had started, and at Jellia's stern command, Hippenscop backed dejectedly down the steps, his eyes bulging with dismay and consternation. If Wani and I had flying sticks, we'd at least be as well off as the rest of these airlanders, reasoned Jellia, resuming her walk. But what funny names, she mused, as the messengers disappeared in two different directions and at two different speeds. They make me think of... Here Jellia took a little run and jump following it with a skip and a hop. I suppose, she continued, talking conversationally to herself, that that is what their names really mean. Everything is so mixed up here. Regaining her throne in one long slide, Jellia brought up with a slight start. This, she decided, was no way for a Starina to act. Smoothing down her dress, she walked sedately to Strut's throne and reached underneath. The real reason she had got rid of the messengers, of course, was so that she could recover the kit bag and have a chance to examine its contents without being observed. The cheer gas had saved them on one occasion, and perhaps there was magic powerful enough to enable her and the soldier to escape from the aerosphere before Strut returned. The bag was still there, and snatching it up in her arms, Jellia climbed back on the throne. But just as she was about to zip it open, Jun and Rump bounded up the steps of the pavilion, dragging a lean old Skylander by the hand. His Majesty's Piper, announced Jun and Rump, giving the Piper a shove forward and seating himself expectantly on the messenger's bench. Jellia was annoyed to have Jun and Rump return so soon, but since she had sent for someone to amuse her, she could not very well object. So resting her chin in her hand, she looked curiously at the royal Piper. The old Skylander was tremendously tall and thin. His tunic was short and plaited, and under his arms he carried a pair of enormous bagpipes. Jellia had never cared for bagpipes, but on an aerosphere she supposed wind instruments such as this naturally would be popular. The piper, however, did not immediately play on his pipes. Instead, he struck a few light and pleasant chords on the top buttons of his tunic. Shall I do a buck and wing, or a little skyland fling? Shall I sing a little sing for you, dear? bawled the piper cheerfully. He looked so funny that Jellia burst out laughing. Thus encouraged, the piper proceeded to sing, punctuating his song with extraordinary leaps and toe tappings. When we skylanders feel low, we just dance the stratus foe. Step it high, kick and fly, toss the partner up sky high, high, ho. Would you care to try it? he asked politely, holding his hand out to Jellia. "'No, no, not today,' gasped the Oz maid, backing as far as the Star Throne would allow. "'But I really enjoyed watching you very much, and your singing is lovely,' she added generously. "'Ah, but wait till you hear me play,' puffed the piper. Raising his pipes, he blew forth such a hurricane of whistles, squeals, and fierce thunderings that poor Jellia clapped both hands to her ears. "'Tell him to go away!' she screamed above the awful din, wildly motioning to Junnenrump, who was tapping his foot in time to the pipes and looking highly diverted. "'Tell him to come back tomorrow!' The fierce music of the bagpipes had brought airlanders running from every direction. Crowding round the pavilion, they waved and bowed to the new Starina. Realising that she would never have any privacy under the imperial canopy, Jellia slipped off her throne. The messenger had the piper by the tunic tails and was easing him gently down the steps. Jellia waited till they reached the bottom. Then, as all the airlanders began to run after the still furiously pumping piper, Jellia started in the opposite direction. Surely somewhere, she thought, clutching the kit bag close to her, somewhere she could find a quiet corner or cave or clump of bushes where she could examine the contents of the wizard's bag without interruption. So anxious was Jellia to be by herself, she broke into a run. 
failing to notice a crystal bar stretched across the path she tripped and fell violently up a tune tree falling down is bad enough but falling up is worse still jellia not only had barked her shins on the crystal bar but had bounced into the air so high she lost her breath and plunged down so abruptly among the top branches of the tune tree that she was somewhat scratched and shaken she knew it must be a tune tree because the plump black notes grew in clusters like cherries between the leaves several dislodged by her fall broke into gay little arias and chords at any other time jellia would have been quite interested but now she was too agitated and upset to care such a country or air tree groaned the oz maid rubbing her left ankle and her right knee one even can't fall down in their own way Parting the branches, the ruffled little girl looked crossly out. It was quite a long way to the ground, but nevertheless Jellia decided to climb down. But it suddenly occurred to her that the top of the tune tree was as good a place as any to open the kit bag. Easing herself to a larger limb, she balanced the bag carefully in her lap and stretched out her hand to pull the tail. Then a piercing scream and the thump of a hundred footsteps made her draw it back in a hurry parting the branches of the tree for a second time she saw want to win battles running toward her like the wind help help save me yelled the soldier with the green whiskers and he had reason to yell for just two leaps behind him panted kabebe waving an enormous crystal rolling pin after the queen pounded the three big blowmen and after the blowmen came nearly a hundred men women and children before jellia had time to even guess why they were chasing the army want to win tripped over the same crystal bar that had caused her upfall and landed with a terrific grunt in the branches beside her scattering half and quarter notes in every direction the airlanders stopped short and watched with breathless interest as the soldier disappeared into the thick foliage of the tune tree what's the matter what happened whispered jellia reaching out to steady the soldier who was bouncing wildly up and down on a nearby limb you gasped Wantowin, almost losing his balance at the shock of seeing her. Oh, Jellia, we must leave at once, at once. As I was passing the cooking caves, Kabebe rushed out and grabbed me. She has decided to blow us away almost any minute now. She has persuaded the airlanders that Strut is lost and never will return. Oh, why, why did we ever fly to this terrible place? Be quiet, his Jellia frightened almost out of her wits at this new turn of affairs how can i think with you making all that noise come down come down bawled kabebe come down before i shake you down grasping the trunk of the tune tree she gave it a playful shake rolling his eyes up the soldier glanced desperately at jellia and jellia as desperately glanced back you might as well go down she whispered resignedly, as the queen gave the tree an enormous shake that nearly dislodged them both. Not without you, shivered Wantowin, hugging his branch for dear life. Oh, well, let's get it over with, said Jellia despairingly. Blowing away may not be so bad, and I'd rather do anything than stay up here. Tucking the kit bag under one arm, Jellia swung herself down by the other and dropped lightly to the ground. What is the meaning of this outrageous behaviour? she demanded, as Wantowin dropped fearfully beside her. "'His Majesty shall hear of this, I promise you.' Kabebe, astonished to see Jellia as well as the soldier with green whiskers drop out of the tree, took a hasty step backward. Jellia quickly followed up her advantage. "'I'm amazed,' she said sternly. "'I thought you knew that I was to help you rule while King Strut is away.' At this bold speech, Wantowin looked at Jellia in round-eyed admiration though her cheeks were scratched and her crown slightly askew the little waiting maid looked every inch a ruler's helper if not a ruler even the blowmen began to shift uneasily from one foot to the other their mouths falling open at jellia's indignation but kabebe raised both arms and fairly screeched at the little oz maid how dare you speak to me like that she shrieked king strut is lost and never will return i am queen here and i don't need your help blowmen seize this impudent pair march them to the edge of the cliffs and blow them away the crowd of stratovanians looked uncertainly from kabebe to jellia his highness left you here to protect me jellia reminded them sternly but even as she spoke she knew they had decided to obey kabebe 
She was flashing her star eyes so threateningly and waving her winged sticks so close to their heads that the blowmen were afraid to defy her. Come along now, grumbled the first blowman, taking Jellia roughly by the arm. You've made enough trouble here. The other two blowmen seized the trembling soldier and began marching sternly towards the edge of Strut's skyland. Jellia pulled back with all her strength, as also did Wantowin, but hustled along by the huge Skylanders, they could do little to help themselves. Relentlessly, with the jeering citizens of Stratovania running along after them, the unfortunate Oz pair was dragged on. "'Just wait till your master hears about this!' sobbed Jellia, as the blowmen shoved them as near to the edge of the cliffs as they dared go themselves. Then they stepped back to lift their horns. Jellia had managed to retain her hold on the wizard's kit-bag, but even so she felt that their last moment had come. Jellia gave a final sad little wave to the soldier, who was really quite brave now that his doom had arrived. The blowmen pointed their horns straight at them, but before they could even inflate their cheeks, a fierce roar and splutter from the clouds caused every head to turn upwards. "'The ship! The ship! The flying ship!' cried the first blowman, letting his horn fall disregarded to the ground. "'It's Strut!' screamed the Stratovanians, treading on one another's toes in their sudden frenzy to be out of sight of their master when he landed. "'Tis the master himself!' cried the first blowman, yanking Jellia and the soldier back from the edge of the skyland. Pulling Kabebi along with them, the blowmen ran as never before, closely followed by Strut's scurrying subjects. One moment later there was not a single air-body in sight. Convinced that their cruel and brilliant ruler had returned, they ran like rabbits. Some even flew, helping themselves along with their winged staffs, while Jellia, sinking on a large crystal boulder, stared dazedly at the silver-bodied plane dropping rapidly towards them. "'It can't be the Oztober!' cried Jellia delightedly. "'It couldn't have come back so soon!' "'It's not!' cried Wantowin Battles, tossing up his cap and waving his arms exuberantly. "'It's the other one, the Ozpril, and that means—' In his extreme excitement, the soldier tripped over a balloon bush and fell seven feet into the air. "'It means the wizard himself has come to help us,' sputtered Wantowin, blinking rapidly as he landed hard on the rock beside the young Oz maid. Three cheers, Jellia! The Wizard of Oz has saved us!' End of chapter 9